Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, uh, and I hope you're enjoying the pizza. Uh, my name's Leah Abrams. Um, I know most of you, I think, or some of you. Um, but I'm a junior here studying public policy and history. Um, and I work a lot with Paulus, so I'm so excited to be with you this morning. Um, as somebody who's super interested in politics, I know most of you are as well, I think it's really inspiring to have two incredibly young, incredibly hardworking elected officials with us this morning who honestly make me feel old and uh, um, unaccomplished. So <laughs> I hope you're ready to feel that way, um, <laughs> to be put to shame by somebody your own age. Um, <laughs> So I want to um, quickly like introduce um, our two guests this morning and then have them give a short kind of bio of what their position is and what they're doing. So this morning we have Cassandra Levesque. Applaud. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Who's coming from New Hampshire and she is elected to the state legislature um, in New Hampshire. And then we also have Garrett Cole. Thank you who is a county commissioner in West Virginia. And I'm gonna have them tell you a little bit more about where they're coming from, um, and then launch into some questions, and then I'm hoping that we can have a nice conversation where um, we take questions from all the attendees. So, um, why don't we start with Cassie? Yeah? Hi, I am, I am from New Hampshire. I am 19 years old. I'm studying political science at Southern New Hampshire University. And I'm also a state representative for my town in Barrington, New Hampshire. And I, this is my first term, and I have been advocating to end child marriage in New Hampshire for about four years now. And I decided to run this year because of it. And. Well, I'm Garrett Cole, and uh, greetings from the great state of West Virginia. Uh, it's a pleasure to be down south with you all today. Uh, I'm a county commissioner, and uh, I like to call us county managers more than county commissioners because people in the legislature, like Cassandra, would like to uh, tell us how to do our jobs. Uh, what we do, more or less, <laughs> is a little bit of everything. Um, you know, we manage everything between the roads. We manage uh, the sheriff's department, the county budget. We're involved in economic development. We're involved in infrastructure projects. Um, you know, I'm on the phone two, three times a week with our congressional and center representations, uh, field reps, of course, not them. Um, and also, you know, we're very active in the uh, state house. Uh, we should be I'm trying to kind of help that trend, actually. But uh, it's good to be here and uh, show a little local representation uh, versus the state. It's good to have both. I think you need you need both. Um, probably more than federal sometimes. Um, okay, so I wanted to just open um, by getting a better idea of why you both ran for office. I think everybody kind of has a political origin story, like when did you first get interested in politics, but it's interesting to hear where that comes from, from somebody so young. Um, so if either of you has thoughts about where your motivation to get into politics came from, um, we'd love to hear about those. So, like I said before, I advocated to end child marriage up in New Hampshire, and I never, I was an art student, I had no interest in politics, and my mentor, Representative Ellen Reed, she asked me around March or April, and she said, you should run, and it would be great, and anybody can run in New Hampshire. You can just go to the town clerk's office and sign papers. And the Thursday before the deadline, which was Friday, I decided to run and I filled out all the paperwork. And I had never thought to be in politics. And so far, I'm finding it very interesting and I like it a lot. I've met a lot of great people. Uh, well, in 2014, I was actually involved in a failed uh, county commission race, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't even know what the county commission really did. Um, we uh, came up with 49.6% no, uh, of the vote. I mean, it was like a 53 vote difference between the winner and the loser. Um, in 2016, I actually befriended our, uh, at that point, our congressman, Evan Jenkins of West
West Virginia's third congressional district, and I was a uh, 11 county field representative uh, for the congressman. And I, and I just kind of honestly enjoyed getting out, talking to people, you know, trying to actually see change come to communities throughout southern West Virginia because we do have our challenges. We have quite a few. Um, I promise that not all of us play banjo and drive old like <laughs> 50s model Chevy pickups with wooden beds on them. And uh, we, we all don't make our own moonshine, okay? I'll tell you that too. But, uh, you know, we had a lot of challenges and stuff. And I decided that year when I was working for uh, Evan, Congressman Jenkins, who's now Supreme Court Justice of the state of West Virginia, um, I'm going to do a write-in ca campaign for commission. I can't do it for delegates, I know all these. But I'm going to do it for commission. So I called a mentor, a, a friend of mine, his name is John Marvin. He's been an excellent friend to me. And he said, there's no way you're going to win. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you're not in the right district. So I had to wait two years, luckily, until 2018, put my name on the ballot June 7th, 2017. I still didn't know what a commissioner did. I just thought, you know, hey, they manage the county guys. I can do that. Um, <laughs> you know, I can still do that in college and everything else. Well, once I got really into it, my name was already on the ballot. I saw the kind of responsibilities it has. But then I got to see how I can be in contact with congressional and state representation to the point where we can actually try and be an advocate for the issues that they don't have the time to look into. And so, you know, I'm really glad and I'm really blessed, in my opinion, to be in the position I am because, I mean, I go home every night. I don't have to stay in the capital city. I don't have to go to D.C. Um, but when I need to, I'm in Charleston, West Virginia, <laughs> capital, or I'm in D.C. So. Thank you both for that. <clears throat> um, one of the things that when we were getting to know each other, we were talking about upstairs is what the campaign process looked like in your various positions. Um, and I think that's a really interesting thing to think about. Um, and I'm also very curious, because you're both so young, um, as to whether that you think that impacted the results of the election. So could you talk a little bit about how your age either hinders or, um, or can serve as an advantage in some ways, um, both in the campaign process and then in the position you're serving in right now? It helped a lot, also because I grew up in that town, so everybody knew me, whether I went to school with their son or daughter, or they were my teacher, or they knew my parents, so that helped a lot. And it was definitely an advantage, because I got to show all the different issues that no one really thought about. And I brought new ideas, and I saw perspectives in college students, because I live so close to a university, I got to show that perspective of what's it like to be a college student. And it helped a lot that everybody knew who I was, and I definitely canvassed a lot, and just went door to door, and talked with people, and... Yeah. So, so when I'd walk into a uh, meet the candidate or something like that, I'd leave my 21-year-old age back there on that doorstep. Um, because, quite frankly, that was one big talking issue against me. Mm -hmm. So I let everybody else talk about that. I said, you know, if you're talking about that, then everybody will know. Okay, that's great. When I walked in, I'd walk in with seven binders of state code and the state constitution of how the state auditor recommends you run a county budget. Uh, infrastructure projects that people have been telling me about on the campaign trail. And I, and, and I would just talk the job. Because, I mean, what you need to see in politics, in my mind, is you need to see a job, not an occupation. You know, I'm not intended to be a county commissioner for 60 years, but West Virginia has happened before, where they just keep getting reelected every six years, and uh, some people don't even know why, but they vote for them anyway. You know, um, but when we go through the parades and stuff, some of you all might not recognize it. it's an older rock. It's like taking care of business by the taking care of business bank. So, I mean, obviously, you know what we're talking about, right? So, I'd blare that. I went and bought a brand new Yon Hall professional grade sound system. I could have put a 15-person band on this sound system, but I had it for that one purpose. And I'd go down through Main Street Richwood, I'd go uh, Main Street uh, Summersville, I'd go down the Craigsville Fall Festival Parade, just blare. And I, I would tell you, you know, I'm, I'm a member of the State Republican Executive Committee, but even the County Democrat Chairperson, who, uh, he's, a, he's actually a friend of mine now, um, would even be dancing along. And he was so much in support of my opponent but he couldn't even help to be excited to say, that's Garrett Cole, he's taking care of business, you know? <laughs> and so, um, you know, we had fun with it, but we were serious when we needed to. Um, you know, I'm the third Republican County Commissioner in Nicholas County since 1928. I had the first Republican majority when I was elected in the Nicholas County Commission 
since 1926. So having an R behind your name isn't really something that's necessarily been popular. We always say that the New Deal changed West Virginia. We had, we, I mean, until 2014, the legislature was a uh, Democrat for 80 years, 82, I believe. So, you know, I'm, I wasn't a popular person. My age didn't help, but I left that to the door. And if any of you are wanting to run out, I think we're eating lunch next with some people that might be interested. Leave that at the door, because people are going to talk about that all they want. Either they can say, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too young, whatever. That's fine. Talk the job, talk the issues. And, well, <coughs> I, you know, I'm trying to build my own tent too high, but I came in at 69.8% of the vote. You know, when you work for it, you get it. That's amazing. That's a high margin. Um, and kind of as a follow-up to that, I imagine that um, when you're trying to leave that at the door, there are some people who, in the day-to-day, -day, are not giving it up, who, who don't take you seriously. Um, how do you deal with that, and how do you kind of demand from your older colleagues that, look, like I am doing the job as well as any of you, maybe better? So... For the most part, I have a lot of support mostly because I've met most of the people in the legislature, so that helps a lot. For the representatives that are so against that I'm very young and don't want to listen, I show them that I can do a lot. I have a lot to say, a lot to think about, and I am ready to bring a lot, not just this one subject. I have many different ideas and I want to implement them. I want to make change here and I'm not going to let them stop me. I'm just going to keep looking forward and I have so many people in the legislature who are in support of me and who are willing to help and listen and everybody there is very excited that we have a lot of young faces and the House of Representatives, so that helps a lot. Well, I'm very fortunate. I don't have 399 counterparts. I have two. And uh, it's Dr. Lloyd Atkins of Bridgewood, and it's Lyle Neal of uh, Muddley, which is right outside of Summersville, the county seat. And uh, they're both, I believe, in their 60s, but don't hold me to it. You know, I'm coming in as a 21-year-old. Um, I was actually accused on the campaign trail, I didn't mention this. I grew a beard to look older. Um, according to some accusations, but uh, it's just kind of a family thing. But anyways, I go in, you know, Dr. Atkins has been a dentist for 40 years, been very involved in the school system, a 12-year member of the Board of Education. Lyle Neal, he's been a contractor farmer. You know, he shows up in his bib overalls and his cowboy hat, and he gets the job done. So, you know, I kind of walked into a welcoming place to begin with, but as time goes on, we get together even more. Really, um, I'll even kind of surprise them because I, I mean, I bring my Robert's Rules little brick of a book, I bring all my state code and everything to every meeting. I've got a stack of piles this high, and they have two sheets of paper on there because they're used to it and I'm learning. But uh, I'll even surprise them sometimes. I'll pull out state code and say, We can't do this, and they're all, Oh my gosh, we can do that. So, you know, it, it, it's not really that it kind of goes back to your preparation, your campaigning. When I walked in the door, I knew what I, was, I knew what to expect, and that really helped a lot gain credibility of the other two. Yeah, um, and you, you touched on something, uh, Garrett, that I was hoping to ask both of y'all about, which is um, we have a Democrat and a Republican with us. You both work with both Democrats and Republicans. I think you know this is a moment when we're seeing, especially on the federal level, um, immense um, lack of, of bipartisan effort. Um, I'm curious, from your perspectives on the state and local level, if you see the same thing, how you try to work across the aisle, um, and how that's been for you. I definitely see a lot of bipartisanship, mostly because there's 400 of us, and every single bill has to come before the House um, during session, and so for the most part, we try to agree, and there are some issues that are brought up that are very partisanship, but we have we get hundreds and hundreds of bills that we have to pass on to the Senate, and then we have to make sure that we are listening to our constituents. And so I think we try to be part bipartisan as much as we can, but there are going to be issues where there is partisanship. But for the most part, we all work together and. 
we'll try to make sure that we get things done and we put in laws that will make a huge difference. That's really good to hear. Uh, the good thing I like about the West Virginia County system is, you know, we get really political in elections, you know. Um, I didn't shove for it, but the county Republicans really shoved for the first Republican majority at all that time. And that's fine. Um, but really, some of my favorite people in that courthouse are Democrats. You know, Bobby Painter is our county clerk, and Bobby seriously keeps that county afloat every single day. I can walk in there right now, and I can ask you how much we have in postage. In the postage account of the county commission of the state of West Virginia, I can tell you to the cent right now what we exactly have. In it. I can do that on anything. I can do that on anything. So really, the thing about the county is again, you know, the state tells us the law. We just read it. We don't get to choose anything. We can advocate during the sessions and stuff, but we're just told what to do. So really, we're showing up for a job rather than to really shove our opinion through in a bill or an amendment to a bill or something like that. Also good to hear that. Um there's some bipartisanship going on the, on the local level. Um, <clears throat> and then kind of going, going off of that, um, you know, this is an age where we uh, are seeing a lot more young people getting involved in politics and having a voice. And I, I think, you know, peripherally, to me it seems like a lot of that has to do with social media um, and kind of the, the access that people have to to a voice and a platform now. I'm curious as to whether technology, social media, kind of was influential in your political process or whether it really didn't, didn't impact it at all. It definitely impacted it for me. I have a Facebook and a Twitter, and so I would get messages from constituents or just from people that are in support of me running, and so, it helped a lot with getting donations for my campaign. I would just post saying I just need three dollar donations per person and I would get like twenty dollars or fifty dollar donations from random strangers that I've never met before or people that I've met before through my campaign. And so I think that it helped a lot with talking with people and setting up meetings with constituents if they have any questions during my campaign or even now if they have any questions that they want to meet up for coffee or just have any input on any bills. Really cool. Well, campaign wise, I love Facebook because I, I, I spent $1,700 on just one order of yard signs, you know, the little signs you put up, but larger signs than that order too. I spent seventeen hundred dollars, and I'll never know how many people I hit with those. How many people just saw them in the front of thirty yard signs in that intersection of the street and they didn't pay attention to it? I can put five bucks on Facebook, hit five thousand people, and I know, and I can track the areas that I advertise in. So if I like, you know, we have a really divided county in Nicholas County right now. We're going through a potential school consolidation of two to one. So you can imagine that's pretty controversial. Well. So yeah, items like that, I never had to address that, but items like that, you might want to only advertise here or there, you can do that. Yard signs, you can do the same, but the cost effectiveness is just, it, it, it's unbelievable. Now, being elected, I posted some picture of Duke University, you'd think I was a student. And it's not because I'm trying to say, oh, look at me, I'm high and mighty. No, it's, hey, look, I'm able to represent West Virginia, little old Nicholas County, 665 square miles of land in the center part of the state, the Bill Lake, some of y'all might recognize that or not. Um, I can go out and represent you all and show that we're not those uh, moonshine making hillbillies that some people might think of north. Uh, just kidding. But, <laughs> anyways, uh, you know, we can really show what we're worth and we can, and we can, and, you know, commission me. I'll post the agenda. I'll just post the agenda on, the, on the Facebook. And people like that so much because they don't know what's going on in their counties because they don't pay attention because they're paying attention to the federal mess that we have right now and the state mess that we have in West Virginia. They don't tell me honestly, I told somebody I was a commissioner and they didn't know what that meant. And then I told them there was two more and they said there's even three of you all you don't get anything done. <laughs> counties are so left behind. Counties are so left behind in the political system. But I'll tell you something, if you really dig deep, you'll see that we do a lot. And that social media is one way that I, unlike the other two, um, have a little bit more of an advantage to really 
Um, you mentioned the political mess um, that's going on right now. I think that resonates with a lot of us, um, and especially those of us who want to have a career in politics or have thought about a career in politics. Um, do you, either of you, or both of you, um, see yourselves as kind of maybe having a, a, a next step politically? Um, and if so, um, what lessons do you take from this period now? Truthfully, I just jumped at this chance to be a state rep, and I have no idea if I'm gonna continue doing this. I have just thought this was a good opportunity to do, and I jumped at it, and I am very excited to see where this takes me, whether it's another two years or even more, or just another two years and maybe something else. Just, I have no idea what I'm doing next after this. Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> um, the county commissioners of West Virginia are elected to six-year terms. Um, I'm three months in. You know, so I've got a lot of time to really think about what not what You not have a I'm kid by the time you're done. Really, I can have a full-fledged family. Um, I mean, you know, I have to think about now what I just did to myself while I'm actually all over again. Um, but really, though, see, the county commission, that's why I like you, because you can be in contact with all these people. You're not stuck to just producing bills. You're not just stuck as governor as representing the state and signing off for uh, veto bills. You know, you can be involved in a lot of stuff. Um, you know, getting into politics, I thought governor was cool, congressman was cool, and all this stuff. I mean, that's cool, man. But once I started seeing the campaign side and all the responsibilities and stuff, I said, you know, that might not be for me. But county commission, I could st I'm, I'm, I'm pulling 15 hours in, in college. Um, my girlfriend's uh, family has been a logging family for 121 years this June. So I work for them. I go to college. My father's a forester. My grandfather, I help look after him. And I can be a commissioner all at the same time. Now, if I run again, we'll see. Like I said, I got a lot of time, but no matter if you want to be in politics for 100 years or you want to be in politics for two years or six years, you need to look at it like a job with responsibilities and never a position because so many people, so many good people go in politics, they get this ego tracked about them and make it all about them, make it all about me. Look what I'm doing for you because I want the recognition. That's when you've gone too far. That's when you need to get out. But that's when people really try to stay in the system. That's when people really try to stay in the system, and that's not the kind of track that I want myself to have. That's what I wish never for you, and that's what I never wish for any politician in the United States of America, because that's why, quite frankly, see, we had Robert C. Byrd in West Virginia. Robert C. Byrd was in politics, my gosh, 60 years. He was a fiddle-playing congressman. Of course, that's from West Virginia. And he, you all, ask your grandparents sometimes. There's a show called Hee Haw. I'm serious. And it was this old country show, they played music, and you know, they had these old country jokes, and everybody's in their middle overalls, and da, 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 da. And he would be on there all the time, and he got reelected like crazy. And half the buildings in West Virginia that are governor that owned the name Robert C. Byrd. Now, I like Robert C. Byrd, but even towards the end, it became, let's, let's build this building for my namesake. It's not, let's build this building so that West Virginia University, for example, can have a new door. That's when it's too far. How, how do you both remind yourselves of that commitment um, to your constituents and not make it about yourselves? What kind of grounds you in that? What helps a lot is I would, I always remind myself, like, my constituents voted me in. They can always vote me out in two years. It's always dangling above my head, and a lot of us, work together and we all remind each other, vote for either what your constituents are saying because they email us and they Facebook message us and they tweet at us saying, hey, vote this way or hey, vote this way. And we try to listen in on that. There are some bills where it just, we have to go our, the way that we want to. We had one bill that we, they said, just vote the way that you want to. At this point, you don't have to listen to everybody else. Just vote the way that you want to. But for the most part, we vote for whether it's, we all come from different parts of the state of New Hampshire. So we have, I come from the seacoast, so our water is not that great to drink. And that's going to be way different from someone way up in Pittsburgh. They're more concerned of what's happening at the border with Canada. 
person is someone that is closer to the border of Vermont. They're worried about what's going to happen if the stream that's in between New Hampshire and Vermont, if it overflows, who's going to take care of the damage? We all come from different parts, and we all it put some input of like, you can't put that drill right there because that's going to make our water worse. First, and you can't just say Vermont's going to take care of it or New Hampshire's going to take care of it. And it just, we all work together. We all put input into it, and we all make sure that our constituents are being heard at the same time. Well, uh, I represent one of 55 counties of the state of West Virginia. Um, I'm a commissioner in a state that is the only state in the union that's actually lost population for the last 20 years. Um, we have a drug epidemic. Our young people leave. Some of my people, some of my friends moved down here to North Carolina, to Indiana, to Virginia, and they don't come back. Um, our average age in West Virginia is getting in the 60s now. Um, of citizens. We, uh, the city of Richwood, which is a smaller town now in the Nichols County, used to be 7,800 people. There are 1,400 right now. We have water systems that are starting to fail us right now. We're having to really press for our federal uh, representation because we don't have the customers on those water lines anymore to pay to upkeep those facilities and those lines. Um, you know, Nichols County used to be a really heavily coal producing county. We, uh, from the coal severance tax that counties uh, collect, we used to have like a 13, a 14, 15 million dollar budget. And because of the, you know, the politics of DC, because of the, you know, the national trade, we went from seven miles to one. And the same county, the four, previous commissioners ran on 13 million dollars, I'm running on 4.7. With the same buildings, trying to keep the same number of deputies, trying to keep the libraries open, uh, 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 help with uh, the national force that we have in the, in the area, and stuff like that. Um, I'm not playing victim here. I mean, I, I, I duly acknowledge my responsibilities, but quite frankly, with all the stuff we kind of have going wrong in Southern West Virginia, it's kind of hard not to be humble. Mm -hmm. Really, when people get unhumble, I know that's not a word, but bear with me, from West Virginia guys. Um, <laughs> when they get unhumble, I mean, it also surprises me. And I'll watch other counties, and these commissioners will get complacent. Because it's the only position in the county, in the county courthouses of West Virginia that's considered part-time. Your county clerk, circuit clerk, sheriff, assessor, um, 911 director, you're, you're full-time. You've got a 40, 60, or 80-hour work week, really. Commissioners, we meet twice a month. We have meetings in throughout, stuff like that. And it became a retirement game in a lot of counties. I'm going to retire, and I'm going to be a commissioner because I have the time to do it now. And unlike, not technically, but unlike the volunteer legislature up north, you know, we're paying almost forty thousand dollars a year. We get state insurance. We get retirement. And all these problems are going on, and people get complacent. Excuse my language, but that really pisses me off. I mean, that makes me sick. I have, I mean, I have binders and books, and I call people all the time trying to find a way to weasel a little bit of money out of Washington, D.C. to actually help us out. I, I go to the legislature in the, in the Capitol, and I tell them, people, you keep telling the counties to do more and more and more, but you cut our funding. They cut the taxes that we can collect. So like I said, I'm not playing victim because honestly, I do enjoy this job. I promise it's an enjoyable job. I, I, for the people that do get complacent, I don't know how they do it. And uh, humbleness, I, I, I think it's hard to not be. Thank you. Um, well, I want to um, be respectful of everyone's time and make sure that they have time to ask questions. So I think I'm just going to ask one final question, if that's OK. Um, and most of you all might not know this, so if you want to feel even worse about yourself, not only are they elected officials, but they're also students. They're in college. Um, so imagine, you know, complaining about Perkins, but then also having to run a county or be in the chambers for the next vote. Um, so I just want to ask you how you balance your time, um, you know, how you make time for your family, um, make time for your studies, um, and then also make time for your political uh, commitments. 
luckily I do online and so I get one class per month so that way I can focus on that one class and also have to focus on other things but I'm also a Girl Scout troop leader so every single week I have 16 first and second graders so every single Tuesday it's a birthday party <laughs> it's crazy um, we normally don't have all the girls there, but sometimes we do have 16 little girls there. And I am very lucky that all of my parents are very patient with me because I, we have a Facebook group and not all the time I can post up there because I'm in work and I can't have my phone on me. And for the most part, my professors and everybody is very understanding that like my assignments might be a little late, but I, they get put out on Sunday, and then I have until the next Sunday to turn them in, work on the assignments, and I can actually do everything, but it's still a little bit like, I sometimes feel overwhelmed, but I am very glad to have people that can help me, and I, do have committee work that I have to do, so I get, I have a binder and it's still filling up of just bills that my committee gets, so we get testimonies, so we have like papers and papers and papers. I literally have trees in a binder, and I am very glad that I am doing online because I definitely feel overwhelmed at some points, but I definitely um, kind of right now it's I'm still like starting out it's just been I got sworn in in December and I started in January so I still getting the hang of it and then who knows <laughs> maybe it will be a lot easier but maybe it won't but who knows <laughs> but we do I mean there's 400 of us there's where it's a volunteer job, you're gonna get the best of what you can out of people when it's a volunteer job, but being Girl Scouts helped a lot with that. Well, I hope it gets easier. <laughs> uh, I run a, I'm running a 15-hour semester of online party class. Um, Dr. Angela McCaskill, the, the great uh, institution of WVU Tech in Beckley, West Virginia, is very patient with me. I'm a commuter student. Um, I never actually stayed on campus on commuting because I help look after my grandparents and my, uh, my father's business and, and now my girlfriend's father's business. Um, it, it's not easy. I have a couple good friends, Ben Anderson and Cody Reed, that uh, if it wasn't for their text messages, I'd forget about tests and homework and symposiums or whatever they're asking for that week. Um, but it, it works out, you know. I mean, uh, I'm kind of taking the philosophy at least B's if not C's get degrees. I'm not proud of that. But I, uh, up to this semester currently, I've been a 3.62, I believe. Uh, that'll go down a little bit. Um, but for the sake of Nicholas County, I'll go. Um, you know, look out for my grandfather. He actually broke his back sneezing. Uh, just he's an 88 year old. Uh, he's uh, still full of energy. He's, he's really kind of been my life mentor. So I'm looking after him pretty okay. My, father, my brother has cattle. My dating version of my father has cattle. And, uh, like I said, they're 120 year old uh, loggers. And so if I'm not in the courthouse at uh, my home office, we don't get offices. Uh, on the log job, on campus, uh, I'm probably hiding somewhere. And I'm not going to tell you where. Uh, luckily, Elizabeth's family does have a, a camp at Greenbrier, and I can uh, revert myself out of the county on cell phone service for a while uh, as needed. But uh, you, you got to have a lot of energy. Um, Shout out to Starbucks for their little double shot <laughs> energy so that you can buy the gas stations. That helps out a lot. But uh, you know, you, you got you to gotta look at it in a way that keeps you motivated. If you keep motivated, you'll, you'll stick to it. Yeah, I think it's clear that both of you have the passion that, that keeps you going. And I really so appreciate you taking your time to be with us today. And I want to let everybody ask some questions for a few minutes. Um, please, uh, you know, raise your hand and um, I can. I think if you project, we'll hear you. So, yeah. Yeah. Hi there. I'm Spencer Schaefer, and I have a question in regards to uh, fundraising. 
Um, how much money did you guys fundraise? And then what were some of the expected challenges fundraising and some unexpected challenges while fundraising? So I don't know the exact number. I'd have to check the um, my ActBlue account again. But uh, I was very nervous to fundraise. I even though I was in Girl Scouts and I could sell cookies, but <laughs> nothing. Um, I was very nervous to ask people for money, and so I just posted up on Facebook and Twitter, "Donate me three dollars." That's it, and. Next thing you know, I had one of my followers say, we can do this, guys. Let's get it done and just donate $3. And next thing you know, people were donating me $25, $50. And we do have to, every single donation, we have to turn that into the secondary state every single month. All of our fundraising money, all of our expenses, including yard signs, uh, pamphlets, bumper stickers, all that we have to turn it into the Secretary of State. Um, another thing that was really hard was trying to figure out a budget when you have no idea what you want to spend that money on. Whether um, I bought yard signs and I bought pamphlets, but I have people saying, oh, you should spend it on a bumper sticker, you should spend it on a Facebook ad, and all these different things. And I would just ask any other representative that I knew and said, do I really need to spend like 50 bucks on a website that I'm not going to use, or should I just walk away and Luckily, I had people that would help me, and it really does not hurt to ask the party. Um, they were a huge help um, to my campaign, whether it was canvassing for me or just handing out my pamphlets at any of their events that they had. So that was a huge help. Definitely talking with the party, getting to know people that were volunteering there. West Virginians are prideful. Um, I was fortunate or dumb enough to never actually ask for a donation. Um, I put in $8,000 myself, which I, I, I you know, didn't enjoy at any time that I had to donate to myself, but you know, we're like that in the mouth. But anyways, um, I was actually really fortunate. Um, uh, for whatever reason, my message and, and my candidacy really started to really inspire people. Um, I, I spent over four, I spent a little over seventeen thousand dollars, and other than the eight thousand I put in, everything was sent to me, never requested by me. So honestly, I, I got it easy. Um, I shouldn't have probably got it as easy as I did. Um, but really, the challenge is is asking, because I mean I'm the, I know some of the most successful mayors, and I'm talking about their job, not election lot, but their job. But still to this day, have not even asked for a contribution because they have too much pride. Because it's not because because like excuse me, like Girl Scout cookies. Give me five bucks, I'll give you a box of cookies. Give me a give me a hundred dollars for my campaign, just so you can go vote for me and, and do two things in one. You don't get anything back, but you're going to get me elected. Here's give me a hundred bucks. That's tough. That's tough. The, the maximum limit in West Virginia is a thousand dollars. I guess it probably is up there too per person. You can donate a thousand dollars per person per election as a contribution. Uh, you for us to not have to. Sorry. Uh, the Secretary of State has us, um, if it's under $25, we don't have to tell the Secretary of State, but if it's over $25, we have to report it. If we got a quarter or we got $1,000, we had to report it in West Virginia, but luckily it wasn't enough at least. But, uh, you know, a, a, a couple people really stepped up. People you wouldn't expect would send you a $1,000 check. So really, you know, get started and just get your <coughs> message going. That's the big thing, because if you have a track record, even if it's just a campaign, not, not even being elected, they say, well, this guy's actually going to take it serious. He might actually win. Okay. So everybody loves a winner. Let's be real. Everybody loves a winner. So they're going to contribute to you if they think you can win. Um, but uh, like I said, I got it easy, so I might not be the best one to tell you about too many of the challenges. Uh, let me tell you something right now. I don't care if it's for dog catcher or president of the United States. You'll never have enough money to do all you want to do. So you got to be picked. 
for Garrett. <clears throat> as a Republican, and uh, I look at West Virginia as one of the most interesting states politically just because of the, I, part of, partially because of the partisan shift, like rapidly from very, very blue state to very red state. Um, however, like looking at the Senate election this year, I'm very conservative, but I had an issue like supporting Morrissey, who had only moved to West Virginia to run for attorney general, and I just felt like he wasn't a good representative of the state. What is your viewpoint of a lot of older Republicans Obviously, you're from West Virginia, but people, a lot of older Republicans moving to West Virginia or to just try to gain political office there. See, that's what Senator Rockefeller did. He was not a, state of, a, rep, a, 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 a citizen of the state of West Virginia until he moved here to run for Senate, and he was there forever alongside Senator Burr, who was born and raised in Logan County. I think he's born like a log cabin. That used to be a big deal when he was running for federal office. Um, you know, Patrick Morrissey and I, uh, you know, we get along okay. Uh, Patrick's not an indecent guy in any means, um, but I did have problems with him. You know, Evan Jenkins ran against him in the primary, and then Don Blankenship, a felon, uh, coal baron, who uh, let his mind safety get so bad out of whack, 29 men died in the upper big branch mine explosion. And he was so pissed off at Joe Manchin, the Democrat that got reelected, he thought he was going to run against him for the U.S. Senate to prove a point. So you have this interesting primary where you have Evan Jenkins, a former Democrat. He was a Democrat for 20, 20, 18 or 20 years. Twisted the Republican Party, not because it was the big trend and everything else, but because he was a, we like to call them West Virginia Democrats. They're pretty conservative, really, let's be real. Um, I mean, even Joe Manchin, I mean, he broke away for a few times to vote Republican um, in, in the U.S. Senate. So Evan switched over, runs for Congress, wins two successful terms. He was, a one, he was the best congressman we've had in a long time, in southern West Virginia at least. And I'm not speaking necessarily as a biased standpoint, which I do have because I'm friends with him, but he really stepped up. When, when we had the 2016 floods, uh, Greenbrier County beside us lost 14 people in one day in one flood. Nicholas County, we lost three major schools in one day. But thank God we didn't lose a person. He stepped right up and did the job. Patrick Morrissey has done good job a good job as Attorney General. He's really working on campaign finance laws and stuff like that. But here's the thing. I talked about West Virginia Pride a minute ago. We're proud. We're proud. Joe Manchin is that old blue dog Democrat that you said that we switched away from as Republican, correct? Yeah. Well, but here's the thing. People know Joe. A lot of people in Somersville, which he's from northern West Virginia, we're in Central, have a cell phone number. I mean, if you need something, you call Joe. You don't call a field rep. Um, in fact, I got his number the other day to get ready to start calling him as a commission. So, yes, he's the only last Democrat other than our state auditor that's a statewide uh, office holder right now. Our governor got elected as a Democrat, but he was Republican when Trump told him to. But anyways, um, uh, uh, I don't like people coming in to run in my state, but I did support him over Joe Manchin. Not because Joe's a Democrat, but because I disagree with a lot of Joe's ideology. Um, but when you come into the state, like, he was labeled New Jersey values. No offense to anybody from New Jersey, but West Virginians are proud of I'm to say it again. You know, we're, we're back home, man. You know, we probably have a cousin or two that makes moonshine. We'll never admit it, but we can probably get you something you need kind of deal. You know, I mean, it's just, you know, <laughs> we're intertwined. And you got an income, an outsider coming in, you know. And that was one of the interesting things about Donald Trump, because West Virginia was the largest state to come out for Donald Trump, not to get on a presidential debate. But, you know, we have this crude, rude billionaire from New York State, and he wins West Virginia. And it wasn't just coal. Everybody likes to say, oh, he's just uh, broke coal, all this stuff. No, it's our values that he aligned up to enough that we voted for him. And Pat Morrissey, he aligned to our votes, mostly, but because he was an outsider, because he did not, he did not embrace West Virginia values the, way, the values the way we saw it, he wouldn't win. That's tough. That's tough probably in most any state. I'm just biased in the West Virginia way, but really, truly, I mean, I, I don't think that that's really a winning strategy for anybody. I represent the people that you grew up around. See, the community raises a person. I can tell you so many people that influenced me in so many ways that put me where I am today. Why would I move? to Vermont, no offense to anybody from Vermont, and run for U.S. Senate. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. The values that I was raised on is where I'm going to stay and try and represent and keep, even if it's on the federal level, like Pat Morrissey attempted. And uh, honestly, feel pretty bad. 
more questions? Yeah. I, I have, I'm a, um, it's a lecturing fellow in the writing program, but I'm originally a political scientist. So I have a question for uh, Representative uh, Beck about um, one of the first votes you had to do for um, Secretary of State um, that was very contentious. Um, if you could just talk about that and like, what that experience was like sort of just coming in. It was very interesting because for a number of years we have never had anybody be run against our Secretary of State and I was very excited for that there was another candidate and I we actually during our direct uh, Democratic caucus we had the Secretary of State come down and give a speech and because we were listening to his uh, the other person that was running against him and so we thought that it was fair and we there was like this huge push to try to get a new Secretary of State in and the Secretary of State during the caucus he spoke for 45 minutes his time was like 15 and that's politics <laughs> it is and I definitely think that there needs to be a change with the Secretary of State I think that the if you go on to our page, it is very hard to navigate, even as a state rep myself, and trying to file for everything, putting in my money and saying, this is what I spent the money on, this is how much I've gotten. That was very hard to find out where to put it and who to tell, and I just thought, Maybe the person that was running against him would clear that up a little bit, make it so that way we can find it a lot easier, so that way we only have to click like one thing versus like several things and go into different windows. And but it was very interesting, and I think that uh, I know that the Secretary of State will not run again in 2022. He said that he's going to retire before then, so. Who knows what could happen? <laughs> Some more questions? Yeah, Elliot. Uh, hi, my name is Elliot Davis. I'm a junior here. Uh, thank you both for coming to speak. Uh, my question is for you. So you had shared, yes, throughout the different questions, some of your yes, skepticism of some of the state government and federal government actions. Considering automation, globalization, renewable energy prices coming down, what type of prices, or, sorry, what type of um, ideas do you think would be helpful on the state level in West Virginia or federally that would help West Virginia, but given those global forces that are shaping what's going on? Ooh, that's tough. Mm -hmm. just that's, a state. Yeah, that's a big one. Uh, that's a bigger fish than we even have in Summerville Lake back home. But anyway, uh, you know, really, we're trying to get so globalized. And, you know, I, I'm a college student. We just did a project on the uh, World Trade Organization. And uh, you know, you get these organizations that get so big and, and, and so diverse in their, in their subject matter that they kind of lose track of where it's supposed to go. So, I, you know, this, I, in my little boss opinion in Nicholas County, I think that we, you know, we're, see like there's a bill, okay, let me put it to you this way. There's a bill in West Virginia right now to consolidate counties. If you consolidate counties, we're gonna give you an extra $5 million a year in your budget. It's nonsense, it's just bribing is what it is. Uh, the same deal we've done for 20 years, and for some reason, the city, the people can all kind of keep electing him, and I can't figure out why. That this is the only bill he produces every year. You know, we talked we talked earlier about like 20 bills that are being introduced per delegate per year. It's got this one bill, and it's to consolidate county. When you start really getting too far away from the communities, you lose part of your culture. You lose local control. Where you have you have you know the man telling you what to do. So really, you know, I'm not anti-globalization in any means. I think it does a beautiful thing for our economy. But on a government scale, we need to keep that local to global connection. Because I mean, we, we have representatives from China, from Japan, from all these other countries coming around Nicholas County to Nicholas County all the time looking for investment opportunities. If it wasn't for county commissioners and our economic development authorities, they wouldn't have the kind of resources they have when they come there. They know this tract of land has this kind of water uh, capacity, this amount of flat land, this amount of this, whatever, because we still hold that part of the whole equation down, even if we are 3,069 3, counties in the United States of America. Uh, that's a lot of people, 
with a lot of responsibility that 100 senators and 436 congressmen couldn't handle. As a quick follow-up, if you don't mind, I guess what specific policies on the federal level or even on the state level would your constituents say they value most and they're most focused on? So are you saying like on a political sense or a governing sense? Either one, like if you were to say like what like environment, healthcare, immigration, like yeah, what are some yeah, of the yeah. issues that people would value? Let us mine coal. That's what they all want to say is let us mine coal. Because like you said, you know, we used to put out so many hundreds of tons of coal a month. It was, it, I mean, it was ridiculous. It was truly ridiculous. Counties like Nichols was producing so much coal, the state legislature actually changed it to where all the counties got a percentage and Nichols County actually got cut in what they got because they were making so much, all these other counties needed a helping hand. Which, I mean, that's fine because now Nichols County is a helping hand with natural gas from our northern counties. Um, but really, you know, um, we're loggers. One of my day jobs is I go down and cut trees for a living. Um, but my father's a forester, and he'll go behind the kind of areas that my dating grows with father-in-law will go log, and he'll replant the forest. We select cut. We don't cut, we don't clear cut like a hay field. We cut all the good trees and let the smaller trees grow. You know, my father's a contractor from Warehouser Corporation, which is based out of Washington State. It's the largest landholder in the state of West Virginia, though. And all that all we all my father's job is is track management. So when we get, well, let me give you a good example. This a personal pet peeve, but a lot of people agree. We're uh, logging right now on national forest, which we know that's a big responsibility. We're logging on national forest. Some of the most beautiful, valuable timber trees that you'll see, we have to leave stand because there's a bug habitat near there, and they need a they need a stronger habitat. We'll go down in a ridge near a river. We can't do that because if one ounce of mud goes in that river, it's going to kill fish. When we know it's not true because we'll build ponds, we'll catch that mud, and then once the once those ponds dry, they can refill again, we can go back to logging and whatever. So we have too much, frankly, it's not activism, but we have too much of a divide right now between the people that do the jobs and the people in Washington, DC, and possibly even on the global scale, to tell them how to do their jobs. I don't know one logger, one previous logger that comes on our log jobs and tells us how to cut down a tree. But they have a four-year degree, no offense to all of us, because I'm getting a four-year degree too. But things like that, I mean, we're a natural resource state, and we can't live off tourism. Everybody wants to push tourism. That's great, but you have minimum wage jobs in restaurants, in uh, kayaking companies, that, that our rafting companies have to be subsidized by the state to even keep over. You tell me how we're going to survive off tourism. You see what I'm getting at? So, but we, we don't have 500 acres flat to build a Toyota plant. So we have to use what we got. And we got trees, we got a lot of them. Let me tell you right now. We have a lot of coal under those trees and those mountains. We can do it responsibly. So rather than just cutting them out and no coal, let's have natural gas and everything else. Once that temperature gets below zero, natural gas doesn't heat like coal does. Let's find a way to do it cleaner, more efficient, more cost effective, whatever. But instead of just cutting with regulation, Let's adapt regulation on stuff like natural resources, on like small economies like Nicholas County is, and stuff like that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Yeah, Kate. Hi, uh, my name is Kate Montano. I'm from a very small town in western North Carolina, like literally the western west town um, in the mountains. And the general narrative around education in western North Carolina, at least, is if you can go to a school like UNC, do something like that, you're getting it. The entire intention of bright young people is getting out, and so I'm wondering, coming from a smaller area in West, in West Virginia, and with the population declining, what do you see the world going to be in your area, and how do you see the area changing as time progresses? Well, it's kind of like, <clears throat> like I was talking about the economics of federal regulation. Instead of just it's like I tell my friends, you know, when they, when they say I'm moving to North Carolina, they move to North Carolina. I don't say, you know, eh, good luck, have fun, whatever. I ask them, you go down there, make a good life for yourself, but when and if you can, please come back. Because if you can innovate down there, you can innovate 10 times easier here because you have so much less competition of just about anything than a coal mine or timber. <laughs> and so, you know, Nichols County, I mean, we've shrunk, I mean, we've shrunk, we, we have shrunk 10,000 people in the last 30 years. You know, we're down to 24 or 800 something, I believe, so we're going to probably be projected that. 
these small, everybody wants to, it's kind of a globalization issue. Economies today are wanting to regionalize too much. You have these hubs of this and hubs of that, but really when you get down to it, there might be some cost savings in some areas, but you're picking and choosing because you could have, Route 19 is a uh, four lane highway that goes through Summersville, West Virginia. We could have a uh, warehouse, we could have a manufacturing plant, anything like that on a smaller scale because of our land. Just the same as you can in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, wherever. But because of this regionalization, you're cutting the, the small areas dry. And you probably see that as well. We used, we've had shoe factories, leather tanneries. We have had, we had the world's largest clothes pin factory in the United States, or the world. Actually, not even just the United States, Richmond, West Virginia. And you know what it is now? It's a falling in building because nothing's gone in behind it. At, at literally, the drying machine killed that business. Um, that's no joke. And, uh, it's just that vacant. There's no reinvestment in these smaller regions because everybody thinks I gotta be in Durham, North Carolina. I gotta be in Charleston, West Virginia. I gotta be in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And you really don't. Because you you know, we don't have all the workforce that all these people need in these small areas. You know, I have twenty five thousand people in Nicholas County that could go to jobs tomorrow, uh, building dozers in a factory because they ran one for thirty years, but they lost their mind with the, with the uh, they lost their job with the mines. So that's kind of where my biggest pet peeve is, is the economy. Um, you know, until these young people come back or stay, like I'm, uh, so I'm so hard-headed I won't leave. Things aren't going to change in these smaller areas. I'm telling you right now, we're going to shrink more, we're going to lose population. West Virginia is the only state in the country that's getting ready to lose a congressional district because we've lost so many people in southern West Virginia where I live. It kills me. It kills me. But until we put money in the economy, put money in people's pockets, other than this is minimum wage stuff, it's not going to get anywhere. And you're going to die even, even more, and just as slowly. Yeah. <laughs> Depressing, but <laughs> so it looks like uh, we're all coming away with a lot of positivity. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have. Um, but before I thank you both so much for being with us, if you could just give these students one piece of advice, one sentence, um, what would it be? If you are ever thinking of getting into politics, don't let your age stop you because there will be people that will point it out to you and you just have to like said, leave it at the door because focus on the things that you want to make a change in, whether that's making sure that every single public place has a recycling place or something small and to just focus on those issues and don't, there are going to be people that will point out your flaws or try to stop you. I know from experience with the child marriage, there were people that were arguing to have child marriage New Hampshire <laughs> and I didn't let that stop me I tried I raised it from 13 and 14 to 16 and now I'm trying to raise it to 18 because I didn't let that stop me I came back with better arguments of why we shouldn't have it and I just came back with more facts than opinions that they had uh, don't be afraid of politics and find your own path. You look at this Kavanaugh stuff, and I'm not trying to say that he was right or wrong. You look at the Kavanaugh, the Michael Cohen, all these people that are testifying, crying in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee or whatever, trying, and, and they're nitpicking what they ate for breakfast two years ago because they think they did something wrong. Don't be afraid of that. Because if you're afraid of that, that stuff's just going to continue and get worse instead of good people like all of you in this room getting in there and making a difference. And find your own way. I don't ask the other two commissioners for permission to vote. I don't ask the other two commissioners how I should deal with an issue. I go get on the state code website, look at the state code. I look up uh, other counties that have done stuff like this, other states that have done stuff like this. Find your own path because if you don't find your own path, you're just falling in rhythm with leadership. And I see that in the legislatures and in Congress. You know, if Mitch McConnell says something, the senators vote for it. If Speaker Roger Hanshaw said West Virginia House of Delegates says something, the, the delegates vote for it. And I don't get that. I don't get that. I disagree with other, both uh, the other two commissioners every day. But after that vote is done, I'll give the three of us credit. We move on. 
you, we could think the other one is the dumbest idiot you've ever met for making that vote, but you know what, right after that, we're gonna agree we're gonna get something done. So find your own way and do not be afraid of the current state of politics. Or stay that way. Please join me in thanking the vote.